John chapter 1, verse 29, you know, we've been talking um, throughout the series a little bit of John the Baptist and, and his role of paving the way and preparing the way of the, the, the chosen Messiah. Uh, but I love John's response whenever Jesus shows up to be baptized. And this is what he says in 1 John 1, verse 29. It says, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Behold the Lamb of God. See, John's doing something here. He's taking his attention off of himself and he's shifting it to Jesus. He's saying, look, the Messiah's here. You know, I think this is so important for us and in, in in how we live our lives that we aren't in the spotlights but that we shift the spotlight to Jesus. Look at what he has done in my life. Not look at who I have become and my success, but that we shift the spotlight to make it set on Jesus. Every shift of God in our lives is meant to get us closer to Jesus. Every shift is to get us to become and to look more like Jesus. It's, it's meant to drive us towards him. You know, these shifts are meant to make us more like him and more in love with him. That's what I believe the shifting is all about. And I know that we need to shift from our self-centeredness and our self-absorbed existence to a Christ-centered perspective. Here's a little bit of revelation that you maybe don't know, but the world doesn't revolve around me, and the world doesn't revolve around you, but in fact, it revolves around Jesus. Meaning the quicker you can get that perspective, the better off you will be. There needs to be this emphasis. There needs to be this focus. There needs to be this drive in us to place Jesus at the center. And it's easy to say, but practically, it's hard to live out. God, you're at the center of my work schedule. God, you're at the center of my free time. God, you're at the center of my marriage. You know, it sounds good. It sounds really good in our Christian bubble to say Christ is the center, but practically lived out, it is so much harder but he is meant to be the driving force that's behind our day, our purpose, and our reason for living. Is that who he is in your life? Or is there other things that are driving you? Jesus said in John 3.30, He must increase, but I must decrease. In Mark 12.30, Jesus says, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. There needs to be this emphasis of Jesus that is increasing every day in our lives. And we, as being in the center of that, are called to decrease in that, and we are called to fall more in love with Jesus every single day. We're called to surrender all to Jesus. And so here's the title of my message and where we're going to go this morning is we're having a conversation about shifting from where we are to where we need to be. And this is what I believe the Lord is wanting to speak to us this morning is that, there need, that we need to be focused on Jesus. And so that's the title of today's message is Focused on Jesus. I believe that this is a major part of a shifting from where we are to where we need to be. And so we're going to use a little bit of a video illustration this morning. Um, Super Bowl's coming up in uh, just a short week, and um, I'm disappointed my Cowboys aren't there, but I'm still going to watch the game, uh, maybe next year. Uh, they have a much better opportunity than those Detroit Lions, just saying. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> I don't want to lose you. I don't want to lose you. I'll bring you back in. I love Detroit Lions. 
Um, <laughs> uh, but as we're approaching Super Bowl, man, there's one of these things that's coming up, and these Super Bowl commercials are pretty amazing and outstanding, and so I love watching them. But uh, there's just been this commercial that's, uh, uh, I think, that's been showing for a little over a month or so now, and as we're talking about this conversation of being focused on Jesus, I feel like this gives us such a perfect visual of what this practically looks like. And so as we watch this, it's funny, it's humorous, but we're also going to kind of use this as an illustration to help me communicate what I'm wanting to say this morning. So here we go. Can I ask you a question? Am I out of focus? You're fine. Yeah, but I mean, look at me, I'm home. I'm all blurry. Well, you're supporting cast. What? The camera focuses on the most important character, which is me. Well, what if my character had a big reveal? Like what? Like maybe I'm the killer. Are you? Isn't that great? I just love that, but I feel like this just so clearly helps us get this visual of what we're wanting to talk about this morning. We're talking about staying focused on Jesus, because here's the thing. He is meant to be the main character. Uh, he's meant to be the thing that stays in focus, and everything else is just supporting casts. Everything else that's going on, that's that white noise, that's, that's buying for your attention is meant to stay out of focus. And Jesus is meant to be the thing that we are focused on. He needs to remain as the one that's in my focus. You know, so badly, there are things out there that are buying for your focus and your attention. COVID-19, troubles at work, stress and busyness, a hobby, trouble in your marriage, panic, worry, depression. And if we let them, they will be the things that become the main characters in our life. They will be the thing that grabs a hold of our focus and our attention, and the things that God desires from our heart will begin to drift in the background, will begin to become secondary, and those will be the things that we pursue, that take up our time, the things that we fill our agendas with, and if we're not careful, they will take the focus of your mind and your thought life, and so we constantly have got to fight to change the focus of our lens. We have to change the focus of our perspective in that focal point. And so if there is one thing that I can communicate to us this morning, if there's one point that I would put in the sermon, it would be this. Shift your focus to Jesus. It's an easy one to remember, right? Simply shift your focus to Jesus. It's easy. It's not complicated, but it is complicated. I want to give you an example of this in Numbers chapter 13, our main, one of our main texts that we're going to be working out of uh, this morning. And to give us a little bit of context as we're about to read the story, you're probably familiar uh, with this passage, but Moses has uh, helped uh, deliver the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt, and they are headed to this promised land a promised land that's been talked about for generations, and they are going to get to be the first ones to step in to that promised land. And so when they get there, there's 12 different tribes of Israel. And so each tribe is assigned uh, uh, the responsibility of selecting a leader that can uh, help be a scout to go and check out this promised land. They can kind of come back and give them some news of what they've found and what they've seen. And so these 12 leaders from these 12 different tribes go in to this land for 40 days, and they check it out. And so here is their report as they are coming back 
from the promised land. Here is their response. And so Numbers chapter 13, and we're going to read verses 27 through 33. It says, this was their report to Moses. We entered the land you sent us to explore. It is indeed a bountiful country, a land flowing with milk and honey. Here is the kind of fruit it produces. But the people living there are powerful, and their towns are large and fortified. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. The Amalekites live in the Negev and the Hittites and the Jebusites and Amorites live in the hill country. The Canaanites live along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea and along the Jordan Valley. But Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. There's all these bad reports, things that they're saying that they're worried about that doesn't look so hopeful, but I love that Caleb tries to silence them. He tries to get them quiet. And here is what he says in verse 30. Let's go at once to take the land, he said. We can certainly conquer it. But the other man who explored the the land with him disagreed. We can't go up against them. They are stronger than we are. So they spread this bad report about the land among the Israelites. This land we traveled through and explored will devour anyone who goes to live there. All the people we saw were huge. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers, and that's what they thought too. Now, we're talking about keeping our focus on Jesus. This was a promised land that, like I said just a moment ago, that had been talked about for generations, that they were told that they would get to occupy and live in one day. And now Jesus has invited them to go and to take possession of this land. But I want you to think about this for a moment. There were 12 spies that went in. And what we know by reading the story, 10 of them, the only thing that they could see was the giants, was the obstacles, was all the reasons as to why they can't take possession of it. These were 10 great men, leaders that had been selected by their tribes, I'm guessing men of faith. But in those 40 days, this was their response, and it came from this place of fear and the unknown. And there were only two of the spies that remained focused to be able to say, listen, if God is in this, that he's going to help us do it, that he is going to help us take possession. They saw promise and provision where the others saw giants and difficulty. So what's the difference between these 12 men? And I would like to submit to you, I believe it's their focus. It's who is playing the main character in what they're seeing in their life. The majority of them are focused on giants and obstacles, while the others are focused on the word from God, are focused on the direction from God, and they believe without a shadow of a doubt that they can possess it and take ownership of it, even though it's going to require some fighting, even though there's going to be some battles that have to be won, even though it's not always going to be comfortable, they believed that they could do it. And so let me ask you and you and me for just a moment. You know, what are we going to do? Because I believe God is presenting us with some pretty incredible opportunities this year. What will our response be? Will we be like the majority that we just read about and just say, man, this is too hard. This is too difficult. This is going to cost too much. I'm out. Or are we going to be the ones that say, you know what, if God said it, He's going to do it. Let's go. Will we set our focus on the promise or the obstacle? Jesus inviting us, I believe, in some aspect of our lives to step out in an area of promise that he has for you, that he has for me. You know, for some of us, he's inviting us to some kingdom opportunities and conversations that he's wanting us to have. For others of us, he's wanting us to step into those areas of freedom. Or maybe he's inviting you to an area of deliverance, to that place of peace. 
or to that position of joy. And so will we set our focus on Jesus and pursue them, or will, or will we be overwhelmed at the thought of the giant task that it's going to require, that it's going to take in order for us to get past those places? Shift your focus to Jesus. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 1. I want you to see something here. As Paul's writing to this church and encouraging them, I think there's some incredible things that we can learn here from this passage and what it looks like to shift your focus from the obstacles to the promise. Uh, We're going to read verse 18, and then in a moment we're going to go back to it and read more context. But for right now, just turn with me to Philippians 1. We're going to read verse 18. This is what Paul says. (coughs) Excuse me. But that doesn't matter. He's talking about some difficult things that he is personally having to overcome. You know, as this letter is being written, many theologians believe that he is writing from prison as he's writing this letter. So he's in a very difficult place. Uh, for standing up and preaching the gospel. He says, but that doesn't matter whether their motives are false or genuine. The message about Christ is being preached either way. So I rejoice and I will continue to rejoice. And I love what Paul is communicating here. And it's that all that matters to him was that Christ was being preached, was that the name of Jesus was being made known, that he was the one that was in the spotlight, and it wasn't Paul. What matters most to us, and what's the priority of our lives? When people look at us, what do we want them to see? Success? Jesus? A title, being funny. You know, what is it that we want others to see? What is the priority of our lives? Anything that serves the purpose of Christ, being known should be the thing that we are going after the most. And here's the thing about that. Whether we like it or don't as to what is the thing that we're having to walk through in that moment, Whether it's easy or hard, the goal of our lives to be what matters most is that Jesus is made known. And so what matters the most to you? Is it comfort? Is it financial gain? Is it a big home? Is it new stuff? Is it likes on social media? Is it a pat on the back? What is the thing that matters most to you? Because here's something that I believe. What matters most to you will determine the way in which you point your life. It'll be the thing that buys for your time. It'll be the thing that takes up all of your brain power and thoughts and dreams and excitement. Whatever matters most to us will end up being our destination. Whatever matters to us will end up being that focal point that's in our lives. And I love what Paul says. He says, whatever is happening to me or whatever it is that they are saying about me, it doesn't matter because Christ is being preached. His name is being brought into the spotlight, so I'm fine with it. And I love what Paul says here at the very end of this passage, and I think there's something significant to this. As he's saying this, he says, so I rejoice. And pay attention to this second part. It's almost like, Does he have a stuttering problem? Why is he saying it a second time? But he goes on to say, so I rejoice and I will continue to rejoice. But I think there's something significant about that. Because when he says, I rejoice, I think he's rejoicing in the moment that God is using his story, his testimony, and his platform for the glory of God, for God's kingdom purposes. And so he's excited and rejoicing and praying and thanking the the Lord for that. But I think the second thing that he says is significant because he says, so, and I will 
continue to rejoice. What's he saying there? It's going to keep being hard. There's going to keep being difficulties. Things are not going to continue to go my way. But it doesn't matter because I'm positioned, I'm positioning myself to rejoice no matter what. That's the significant thing that I believe we can see here at the end of this passage. Paul is making a shift. He's making a decision in his mind, no matter what, I will rejoice. He's saying that I want my focus to be on Jesus. And if it is, then I will rejoice. And I will continue to rejoice. He's aligning his will which will dictate his emotions for that moment and in moving forward. And so I want us to keep reading to get a little more context in this passage, and I want you to see something that he keeps saying over and over and over. It's like this repetitive pattern. And so every time that we see I will or the word will, you're going to see it underlined on the screens. You can underline it in your Bible because every time I believe we see this, I think it's Paul making this decision that I've got to make a shift here, that I can't stay where I'm comfortable, but there's got to be a shift in my thought life. There's got to be a shift in my approach. There's got to be a shift in how I'm doing things. Because he wants to get from where he is to where he needs to be. And this was an invitation that he was giving to the church then. And that he is giving to us. And so let's keep reading. First, uh, I'm sorry, Philippians 1, 18 through 25. But that doesn't matter whether their motives are false or genuine. The message about Christ is being preached either way. So I rejoice and I will Continue to rejoice. Every time you see it, say it with me this morning. Verse 19, for I know that as you pray for me in the uh, spirit of Christ, Jesus helps me. This will lead to my deliverance. For I fully expect and hope that I will never be ashamed. He's having to make a decision to shift in this area of his life. I will never be ashamed, but that I will Continue to be bold for Christ, as I have been in the past, and I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ, whether I live or die. For to me, living means living for Christ, and dying is even better. Wow. (laughs) But if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ, so I really don't know which is better. I'm torn between the two desires. I long to go and be with Christ, which would be far better for me. But for your sakes, it is better that I continue to live. Knowing this, I am convinced that I will remain alive so I can continue to help all of you grow and experience the joy of your faith. All right, I'll pause there for just a moment to highlight this. I think this is significant. I think this is a shift that many of us need to make in our life. And as we are looking at the circumstances and places that we're at, is that uh, what he's saying here is, I will remain alive so that I can continue to help all of you grow and experience the joy of your faith. He's not focused on himself. He's not focused on his situation, his circumstance, but he is being others focused. And I want you to think about that for just a moment. Maybe there's times in our lives or, or maybe the purpose of our life isn't meant to be about me, but maybe it's meant to be about someone else's progress. Maybe the focus isn't just on me, but maybe it's meant to be on others and helping them get to the other side, get to those places of calling and fulfillment. We are called to be others-focused. We are called to help others move forward. That is one of our foundations as a church, the importance of remaining and staying as others-focused. Don't get too focused on self. Can I just encourage you in that this morning? Because if we do, we're going to miss out on the main goal of our lives. 
which I believe is the progress of others. It's sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. It's giving our life away for the progress of the gospel, of the good news for others. And so I think it's important for us to keep this as one of our focuses as we're focusing on Jesus. Let's keep reading. Verse 26. It went, so we're six times where he said will. Uh, verse 26. And when I come to you again, you will have even more reason to take pride in Christ Jesus because of what he is doing through me. Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. Then, whether I come and see you again or only hear about you, another shift, I will know that you are standing together with one spirit and one purpose, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. You see, in this passage of Scripture, Paul isn't saying maybe. He's not. He's making a determined decision that I will, no matter what. It's got to be a shift that happens in our life. Hey, I'm, I'm shifting my focus to Jesus. That's going to be my priority today. That's going to be the priority of my future is that I am focused on Jesus. I'm shifting my mind. I'm shifting my body. I'm shifting my will and my emotions. I will align myself in a way to focus on what matters most to Jesus. To what matters most for his kingdom. And to what matters most for the progress of others. I will shift my focus to Jesus. Shift your focus to Jesus. And in closing this morning, I want to go back for just a moment, and I want us to look at the life of Jesus. I want you to remember this as we are looking at the life of Jesus. He is fully God while he's here on this earth, but at the same time, he is fully man. And as you read Scripture and you understand the story of Jesus, we know that he was sent by God for a purpose for while he lived here on this earth. But we also know that Jesus was willing to come. There had to be a sacrifice in order for us to, to be saved. Something had to atone for the sin of all mankind. No longer was animal sacrifice and blood sufficient. But there needed to be something that would once and for all wash away the sins of the world. And so Jesus said, I will go. And so God sends Jesus to atone for our sins so that, we could no so that we no longer are slaves to that fallen nature, but that we have sonship in Jesus Christ. Jesus came for you, and Jesus came for me. He came on assignment. And so many different times throughout his ministry, he came to help us get this heavenly perspective of what the kingdom of God culture was all about, of what it looked like to have the perspective of heaven and not just of this earth. Jesus consistently introduced those around him and used to stay focused on the kingdom of God ways and perspective. That was his desire for us to learn those things. And so as he teaches us to pray, I want you to see something. We're going to look at a couple of different passages of Scripture. But as he teaches us to pray in Matthew 6.10, this is what Jesus says. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What's in the kingdom of God agenda, may it take place here on this earth. What is he up to in your life? What is he up to in this greater Kalamazoo area? What is his will? I believe that we are meant to be conduits of the will of the Father. We are meant to be his ambassadors. We are meant to be the physical representation to make it on earth as it is in heaven. 
Jesus said in John 5, 30, I can do nothing on my own. This is Jesus speaking. I judge as God tells me. Therefore, my judgment is just because I carry out the will of the one who sent me, not my own will. Even while Jesus was here fully as God and fully as man, he was submitted to the will of his Father. That was his focus. That means that should be our focus as well. Jesus wants us to pursue the things of God. And he wants us to to fulfill the desires of the Father, just like he did. We've got to stay focused on Jesus and align our priorities with his in Luke 22, 42, Jesus was in the garden. And this was his prayer. Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. You know, here in the garden, Jesus knows what's coming next. He knows that he's about to suffer. He's about to be beaten. He's about to be ridiculed. He's about to be humiliated. And he's about to die a slow death on a cross for the sins of all of mankind. He didn't deserve it. And his prayer was, God, if you are willing Take this cup of suffering away from me. But if your plan is different, that's what I want. That's what I desire. And here's the beauty I believe in this story. Is Jesus says, listen, I understand suffering. And so I understand the sufferings that you're going through. I understand those places of pain, of loss, of hurt, of humiliation. I understand that disease. I understand that sickness. I understand suffering. I've been there. But I'm with you through it. And what Jesus wanted to teach us, what he wanted to model for us, is that even while we're walking through those hard times, to keep our gaze focused on Jesus on his will and his desires and the plan that he has in store for us. Jesus continued to serve the will of the Father. And so I think our invitation is to stay focused on the kingdom agenda that he is working out around us. And this is hard. But as we've been talking throughout this series about making these small shifts, making these small adjustments and changes in our life. This is one of the things that I believe that we have to do is in our focus of what's priority, of what's the driving factor behind our lives is daily we have to align that focus with his desires for our life. It's a decision that we have to make and we may never ever fully understand all the whys all the house. But here's what I know is that he is telling us to position ourselves to trust and to obey. To carry out the will of the Father and to not get too focused on ourselves. That we don't miss out on our calling to help others move forward. But to remain others focused. Paul goes on to say in Philippians, in in chapter 3, verses 13 through 14, he says, No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing. Paul's saying it's hard, (laughs) but you've got to stay focused on the one thing. Remain focused on the one thing, forgetting the past, 
in looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and to receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. We've got to shift our focus to Jesus. Would you stand to your feet with me this morning? Hey, Firm Foundation, Pastor Blake here. Thanks so much for tuning in to our service. We hope that you were encouraged through the service today and that you were strengthened in your relationship with the Lord. We hope you enjoy the message today. God bless.